depth study in the book of first Samuel we've been looking at the life of of David King David we've been looking at King Saul Saul we've been looking at the prophet Samuel we've been looking at uh, the Prince uh, Jonathan and several other uh, characters unique to this particular uh, study and last week we started I believe last week we started talking about uh, Nabal and Abigail in the 25th chapter of the book of first Samuel and tonight uh, we're going to go back to that uh, chapter because there are some things and uh, there's a lot of things within this chapter uh, that we just can't brush over and leave uh, immediately but we definitely want to make sure that we're covering everything as the Lord uh, gives us to, to cover so tonight if you're taking notes i'll try to go as slow as possible uh, we do love the interaction at the end where people have the opportunity to ask questions uh, or call into the prayer line we will have prayer uh, afterwards this evening the lord gave me a prayer list for us to pray about um, and someone mentioned earlier especially for those who we will be impacted by the hurricanes uh hurricane harvey uh, irma and the other three that are out there uh, in the ocean. So we definitely want to make sure that we are praying for those also for some of the natural disasters that are going on out on the West Coast. There's a lot of fires going on in the state of Washington, uh, California, and Oregon. Uh, so we definitely want to pray for the people that are impacted in the impacted areas, but not only just for the U.S., but also uh, for other people around the world. I have several pastors, too, that I would like for us to pray for when we conclude this evening. Amen. So let us pray, and we'll go right into the word of the Lord. Amen. Amen. Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, we pray that your blessings be with us be upon us and God that you go into your word with us so that you can bless us with the insight, the revelation, the knowledge, the understanding, everything that we need to gain from your word tonight, God. Whether you choose to come across seriously, whether you choose to come across humorously, God, however you do so, we know that you're in it. And we don't want to move far forward unless you send your anointing. We understand, God, that without your anointing, we can do absolutely nothing at all. And God, we're just so appreciative unto you, to your grace, to your glory, for the things that you're doing. And God, we just want you to get the glory and the honor out of our lives. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen and amen. <laughs> And again, we're going to be looking at 1 Samuel, the 25th chapter. We're going to be looking primarily at verses 13, 32 to 34. And as, of course, those who know me know that there are other scriptures that will be forthcoming as well. So 1 Samuel, the 25th chapter, verse 13, reads as follows. And David said unto his men, Gird ye on every man his sword. And they girded on every man his sword, and David also girded on his sword. And there went up after David about 400 men, and 200 abode with the stuff. And verses 32 to uh, 34, and David said to Abigail, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, which sent thee this day to me. And blessed be thy advice, and blessed be thou, which has kept me this day from coming to shed blood and from avenging myself with mine own hand. For in very deed, as the Lord God of Israel liveth, which have kept me back from hurting thee, except thou hast hasted and come to me to meet me, surely there had not been left unto Nabal by the morning light any that pisseth against the wall. Amen. And tonight we're going to be talking about vengeance. Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. Amen. Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. When we look at this particular scripture, we see in verse 13 that David 
is girding his men for military action. Doesn't say whether this action is a lawful action, but we see that he is gearing his men, preparing his men mentally to prepare to go out and to slaughter Nabal's household. David has get, issued an order, his men who respect him. He's taken two-thirds of his military force of 600 men. He's taken 400 men with him, leaving 200 men by the stuff to care for their possessions, to look out for the camp, and to protect the camp from any raiders that would ultimately or eventually attempt to come and take David's stuff. So all of his men now are geared up. They're ready to follow him. He issues the order. David is now pursuing. So the scripture lets us know that David, in this case, because of what Nabal has refused to do for him, going back to what we talked about last week, just to lay the foundation, David's men in the wilderness, 600 warriors, are guarding Nabal's shepherds. They just happen to be in the same locale that David's men were. David's men are exhausted. They're, in, they're running from Saul. David is running from Saul for his life. And now their supplies are just about exhausted. He has protected Nabal's shepherds. He has made sure that none of their possessions are taken. He's made sure that they're not harmed by any marauders that are out there, by the Philistines, uh, by any other persons. He's making sure that they're not robbed. He's making sure that the sheep or the, whatever livestock they are guarding is protected. And even his young men says to, to, to Nabal that his soldiers were a wall unto us. They protected us while we were conversing with them. The whole time they were conversing with us, they were having lighthearted conversation. They were just being just men of protection. The warriors that they are, they are protecting the interests of Israel and every citizen of Israel. And David asked a request, simply, okay, give me something so that I could feed my men and myself. He sends young men as envoys to him. Nabal comes back rather sarcastically and also as a liar. We know that he lied because he said, who is this David? But yet the second part of this statement was, there be many servants nowadays that break away from their masters, so, so to speak, to paraphrase it. He knew that because we find out later in the same chapter that his wife Abigail entreats David and also tells him that she knows that he has been anointed. He, she knows that he has not sinned. She knows that God has anointed him to become king and that his kingdom will be a prosperous kingdom. So we know that Nabal lies. So David is furious. He is so furious that he's not thinking rationally. Now, how many times have we been upset because of a set of circumstances, because of how someone has responded to us. We have shown them an act of kindness and yet they return sarcasm. They return lies. They return unwillingness and they, re they return their attitude. And you looking at them, we know how we want to say, we want to say mm, 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 that, you know what, they, they actually are acting like this. Okay, come on. We, we know sometimes we go there in our minds. We go there in our spirit. Let's just be honest. We talked about that a few weeks ago. Some Christians, they say things out of their mouths that they ought not say. They think things that they ought not say. And when people rub us the wrong way, some of us who have not fully been completely saved, we're being saved, we're still working out our own soul salvation with fear and trembling, but yet when someone pushes all of those buttons and they push them the correct way, when we are unawares, they catch us off guard and we go there. David had in his mind that he's going to go and take care of business. We know this because of his actions. He's telling his men to gird himself, gird themselves with their sword. This is not a passive posture. 
This is a very aggressive posture that he's taken. He's not girding on his sword to go have a conversation. He's girding on his sword to actually go out and do some action. So David, in essence, is taking vengeance into his own hands. When we talk about vengeance, we talk about inflicting or the infliction of injury, harm, or humiliation, or the like, on a person by another whom has been harmed by that person. We know that when we have been harmed, when we have been uh, actually embarrassed, when we have actually been put into a place that is uncomfortable by someone's actions, by their words, by their deeds, we know that naturally it's a normal human reaction to think that they're what the, can they do in retaliation towards someone. This is where the heart of arguments come from. This is where the heart of discord comes from. This is where the heart of bitterness, anger, hatred, variance, and malice, and wrath all comes from. When one has been wronged by another, and they want to do something to either save face in front of others or to feel as though that their rights have been violated and is worthy as well within their rights to react and to respond. It's also an act or an opportunity of inflicting the same level of difficulty, trouble, or thing on someone else. This is the strong desire of revenge. And we know all of the emotions associated with vengeance. We know our adrenaline gets to pumping. Our hearts start to racing. Our blood starts to boiling. Our mind starts to think, plot, and scheme and come up with ways in which we can get that person back. It may not happen in a moment. It may be something that we premeditate upon for a period of time, for hours, for minutes, days, weeks, and in some cases, years. And even years later, people are still acting in vengeance or vengeful because of things that have happened to them. They want to inflict the same amount of hurt the same amount of injury, the same amount of pain, the same amount of humiliation, the same amount of, of what they've gone through and what they've experienced so that the person can understand the pain that they went through. We're not necessarily looking for empathy or sympathy. We're not even looking for understanding. Some of us aren't even looking for forgiving that other person. Some of us are, aren't even in the mindset that we are willing to interact with that person until we get revenge. And this becomes a strong emotion, a strong feeling that we must act based upon what has just transpired. This is the act with force. This is the act with violence and understand it doesn't necessarily mean physical violence. Sometimes it's just the violence of the words that are spoken, the thoughts or the things that are done sneakily or slyly or done underhandedly. And even listen to this, even those to whom we employ to help us carry out our plots and our schemes, in some cases, we're bringing innocent people into a situation that they know not of, and we are putting them in the middle of something that they really aren't aware of, nor have an opportunity to say whether or not they wish to be involved in. Sometimes we get those persons on our side. You know they have our mentality. They take on our persona. They take on our way of seeing things, how we view things, and not really checking us to say, wait a minute. Pastor Whitfield, that's wrong. No, you need to check yourself. You need to go back and pray. You need to repent. You need to consider some other things or some other options. You're not thinking rationally 
in this particular moment. You're thinking out of pain. You're thinking out of your hurt. You're thinking out of your anxiety. You're thinking out of your embarrassment. You're thinking out of all those negative attributes and feelings that you're feeling right now. One of the things that you need not to do is not to make a decision or react until you have calmed down and thought the situation through and think about a godly approach to this particular situation. I know a lot of people who are hot headed. I'm thankful unto the Lord because the Lord has delivered me from being hot headed. And when we understand that how hot headed we can be in situations and knowing what the, the damage that we have caused and created, we learn to step back, look at things very differently and really Feel and feel ourselves out in the moment and say, I need to drop back. I need to pray. I need to refocus. I need to wait for this to pass and then ask God how to proceed and handle it. David wasn't of that mindset in the moment. He was unreasonable. He was excessive and he was surpassing the degree of his thought process and rationale and which he really should have done what he should have done now he was all he was thinking about reprisal retribution revenge some of the acronyms that go with that synonyms or acronyms counter blow repayment requital return vengefulness wrath uh, avenging uh, evening of evening up the score and doing an eye for an eye getting even and settling the score let me break it down what David was really about to do. Let me break it down in modern terminology. David was about to do the biblical equivalent of a drive-by. In other words, he was getting ready to do a gallop by. I know that's sort of kind of corny. That's my sense of humor. He was getting ready to do a biblical drive-by where he was going to inflict the maximum amount of pain because of what he had experienced, because of the fact that he was embarrassed and that he felt as though that it was well within his right to ask for an act of kindness, a favor for an act of kindness shown, return another kindness. How many times have we shown acts of kindness towards someone and they repaid us evil for an act of kindness. Here's David and his men. They're on their horses. They're galloping along. They have their swords at their side and they're ready to take care of business. And here comes a woman of wisdom that stops him and entreats him. And now David is understanding that he cannot take vengeance on his own hands. David, which we talked about last week, was about to commit mass murder. This was not an enemy of God. As a matter of fact, when Abigail entreats him, she tells him that I know that my Lord fights the battles of the Lord. There is a major difference here. Here is an Israelite, a churlish man, Nabal who does not walk in wisdom, his name means foolishness, which we talked about last week. He was literally the epitome and the classic example of a 110% fool. We can call him a fool because the Bible calls him a fool and paints him in the light of a fool. We talked about that last week. Many of us who are associated with fools need to cut the cord of connection to every foolish person in our lives. I want to take it a step further this week that we cut association with every foolish decision that we are making or have made or are about to make and understand that we must employ the methodology and the means of wisdom godly wisdom and approach things in a godly vein 
we must understand that we must look out amongst our associates, our people that we are connected to, our associates in ministry and things of that nature. And we must understand that we do not want to be associated or connected with foolish people and foolish methods until they come to a place that they can really understand what it is that God wants out of them. Understand this, the key that we're talking about tonight is not being vengeful. This is us meaningfully, knowingly, thoughtfully, and prayerfully releasing our rights to seek revenge. That's a hard pill to swallow for a lot of people. And even for Christians, I want to slow down and I want to pause right there because there are too many Christians today that are seeking vengeance on their own. The Bible says very clearly in Romans, the 12th chapter, and I want to talk about those four verses there. I'm going to read them. And we're going to talk about them. It said, starting at verse 18 in the 12th chapter down to verse 21, is that if it be possible, I'm placing emphasis on certain words, if it be possible, as much as life in you, live peaceably with all men. Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath, for it is written, vengeance is mine. I will repay, saith the Lord. Therefore, if thine enemies hunger, feed him. If he thirsts, give him drink. For in doing so, thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. Now, we know that the word first in, in, in the very first part of verse 18 says, if it be possible, let's be honest. How many possible people do we have out there? We know the argument. Some of us take that possible literally. Lord, now you know it just ain't possible to deal with that person. I'm going to take matters into my own hands and deal with them myself. Possible means be done. I'm done with them. I'm through with them. I'm over with them. God, I'm going to seek out vengeance on my own. But know that possible means just the same words, be done. God is telling us to be done with it, be over it, get over it, be healed in your spirit, be healed in your soul, be healed in your mind, and just, as they sing in the song Frozen, let it go. Let it go. If I could sing, I would break out singing the song right now, but thanks be unto God that I don't know how to sing and I don't know all the words. But we need to just let some things go. It's not worth your attention. It's not worth your time. It's not worth your energy. It's not worth any of those things. God says, as much as life in you, live at peace with all men. Let's talk about what really lies in us. What, what's really in our hearts that make it difficult to live with others and to deal with them. Sometimes we have some hatred, some anger, some bitterness, some residuals from some other things still living on the inside of us. We may be sweet on the outside, always have a smile on our face, but deep down on the inside, there is something that is lying dormant that we have not dealt with that we have not come to grips with, that we have not come to the understanding of, that these things need to go. We need to deal with some of those things that are lying on the inside of us. We have some Nabal inside of us. Yes, we have some of the genes of foolishness. 
We have some of the genes of bad decisions. We have some of the genes of bad decision-making process. And some of us are still making bad decisions today. But this is a good thing. Because if we need to have a deliverance service tonight to people get free, then we will shift immediately and we will go into deliverance mode. Because open confession, the Bible says, is good for the soul. If you don't deal with it, it will deal with you. And how it deals with with you will be far more harsh than if you were to allow God to deal with it. Let the God of vengeance, who will seek vengeance on every enemy, every foe, every characteristic that is unlike God, deal with it to get it out of us. God wants us to deal with it. Listen, all of us have been hurt We've all been lied on. We all have been disappointed. We have lost loved ones. We have felt rejection. People have used us. We have denied us, stood us up, and they've said we would be there and would be there for us, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But we know all the hurt and the pain that comes from it. We've all been there to some degree. But we have to learn that we are overcomers. If we are overcomers, then we are not vengeful. When we learn how to live peaceably with all men and return an act of kindness for an act of, of someone who has done something wrong, the Bible says in Romans, the 12th chapter, be not overcome with evil, but overcome evil with good. And verse 20 says, therefore, if thine enemies hunger, feed them. If they thirst, Give them drink. This has a major, understand the Bible. The Bible always deal with psychological impacts. This causes a thought process to come into the person's mind. I've shown this person all of this harshness, all of this evil, everything that I can imagine, everything that I can think of, everything that was in my arsenal. I threw every single thing at them, every missile, every bullet, every knife, every arrow, every dagger, everything that I could have done. And this person comes back and see me in need and sees me hungry, starving, and they feed me. They see that I'm thirsty and they go out of their way to get me a cup of water. Or something to drink. They're taking hard earned dollars out of their pocket. And they're investing something in me. That would help my, my life to be sustained. To help my blood increase. To help my life to be far more better than what it was before. Think about the ingestion of that psychological approach. And the major impact that it would have on that person. This will put them in a thought process about you. And believe that your testimony about God is true. Just think about the years had you sought vengeance. What would have driven that person further and further away to say that Christians are no more than a bunch of hypocrites, which I've already knew that they were. When they can see that you've done something contrary to their own actions, and now you are actually showing them an act of kindness, think about how long that would stick with them. This goes back to the very word that says one man waters, one man plants, one man waters, but God gives the increase. It also speaks to the scripture that he who wins souls is wise. It also speaks that the wisdom of this world is not the same wisdom that God wishes to employ. It shows that everything that they think or thought is just the opposite. And there is something to this faith of serving God, the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. And it puts them in a mindset that now, they must rethink their posture and their position. They look at us in a different way. 
They didn't return evil for evil. They didn't return the negative emotion. They didn't try to murder and assassinate my spirit. They tried to help me out. And they even, even if you didn't speak, even if you didn't speak the word of the Lord to them. Listen, the Bible said that we are written epistles, read them in. Your actions alone reeks volumes. It reeks volumes to the point that they come back years later and whether known to us or unbeknownst to us, they decide that in an hour of extreme need that they're going to bow their knees unto the Lord because of something that transpired in their lives Many years ago, many months ago, many hours ago, and they make a conscious decision that God, I need the God of that sister who I retaliated against, but she fed me. God, I want to serve the God of that brother. When I needed clothing, he clothed me. When I needed a place to live, he housed me. When I had no money, they paid my bills. But I was angry against them because I didn't understand the God that was in them. And now, God, I come to you as humbly as I know how. And now I seek your face to get what they have and to have that experience with them. Isaiah 63 and 4 says this, For the day of vengeance is is in mine heart, and the years of my Redeemer is come. Psalms 94 and 1 says, O Lord God, to whom vengeance belongeth, O God, to whom vengeance belongeth, show thyself. There are times where God will actually have us to pray for vengeance to be done. And there are other times, the vast majority of times that I've found, that God will actually tell you to pray for peace and let you know that vengeance is his. Why is it so important that vengeance belongs to God and not to man? Because our vengeance does not execute the righteousness of God. Vengeance, our vengeance does not yield the results that God wishes to resolve. Our vengeance seeks to act right in there where God, who has also shown loving kindness and patience with us and gentleness towards us, want to be able to extend that same right to someone else. He doesn't want to just wash people out or, or, or write people off. He wants them to have the self same experience. Listen, in our sinful state, Think about how many people we ticked off. We're not as innocent as we say we are. We have ticked a lot of people off. I could tell you from experience, I've ticked a lot of people off. But I also learned when I came to salvation that I must be healed and I must seek God and I must forgive. God wants us to seek the opportunity for forgiveness and he wants others who do not know him to come to forgiveness as well. Psalms 149, he wants to execute vengeance upon the heathen and punishment upon the people. Those who do not wish to obey him, those who wish to stand in direct defiance against him with an unrepented, unregenerated heart, Ultimately, God will seek vengeance on him. The Ezekiel 25 and 7 says, I will execute great vengeance upon them with furious rebukes, and they shall know that I am the Lord when I shall lay my vengeance upon them. There are times that God's vengeance isn't life ending. Sometimes God exacts vengeance on his enemies or his foes or those who are doing things against his will to show his strength, to show his power, to get their attention so that they will ultimately repent. If not, then God will further his vengeance. Thou hast seen all their vengeance and all their imagination against me. 
Psalms 58 and 10, the righteous shall rejoice when he seeth the vengeance. The vengeance, he shall wash his feet in the blood of the wicked. But I also want to go jump down real quick. Uh, also, Isaiah 61 and 2, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our Lord. But what is the main reason why the Lord himself wants to execute vengeance? There is a universal enemy who is defiant of God and of all of mankind. Adam and Eve met him in the garden and they were beguiled by him. They were lied to by him. They were deceived by him and they fell because of his words to them. He mixed a the truth with a lie and deceive them whereby they fell. That was in Genesis in the very beginning. But in the book of Revelation, we see a writer in the very chapter 19 verses 11 to 21. We see a rider once again on a horse, a white horse. David was an example of God, of Jesus, but he was not allowed to exact vengeance on the enemies within his border, but he was allowed to execute vengeance on the Philistines who were the enemies of Israel and the enemies of God. So Jesus in the book of Revelation, he is going to enact once and for all, and we can all say hallelujah, glory be to God, thank you, He's going to exact vengeance on the very enemy that has beguiled us. Listen, deceived us, caused us to think that we could take vengeance. All of those traits that we talked about earlier. He is going to once and for all defeat our enemy. The serpent, that dragon of old, Lucifer. Beelzebub, the father of lies, the father of destruction, the father of sickness, the father of disease, the father of sin, of rebelliousness, all of those things that the Bible calls the sinful nature that flow forth from him, his rotten fruits, his rotten fruits. And the one who has brought those rotten fruits he will destroy. Listen to what Revelation the 19th chapter verses 11 through 21 says. It says this. It says, And I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called faithful and true. And in righteousness he doth judge and make war. He judges and he makes war. Everything that around that's around you that is giving you warfare, the rider on the white horse is going to deal with it and judge, and he's going to have a, a successful military campaign, and he will be victorious. He's not going to get locked into a 20-year war and walk away after having lost with his hip between his tail between his legs. No. He's going to walk away from this battle, battlefield victorious. He's going to be the conqueror that we praise and worship. Hallelujah, Jesus. For all eternity, all of us are going to bow down before every knee, every tongue, every language, every nation, every demonic spirit. All of us are going to fall down and worship him and say that he is Lord of Lords. Whether they have chose to repent and live in eternity or whether they die and go to hell, it's best to do it now that they will worship him. Listen to this war posture. The, in righteousness, he does judge and make war. He is not a passive warrior or king. He is a very active king. You know something? I really wish that we are, as a country would follow the example of the biblical example, where when a, when a nation went out to war, the king led them. And he was a major part of the military strategy in the kingdom. I believe that we as apostles, pastors, teachers, prophets, evangelists, we need to be on the front line leading the charge.
towards God. Listen, his eyes were as flames of fire. This means he was furious with his enemy. It also meant that he meant business. He was sick and tired of this enemy and his eyes reflected that he was focused, he was purposeful, and that he's going to achieve his objectives without excuse, without being exhausted, and he knows that those who are following him, they're gonna be just as victorious as he is because he is the crowned victor. His eyes were as flames of fire, and on his head were many crowns, he had many crowns, and he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. He had a name that no man knew but he himself. Listen, and he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood. Just imagine, in David's time, in biblical times, when men fought with swords, bows, and arrows, they got up close on their enemies, and their blood from their enemies was over their face, their body, their clothing, over their armor, over their weapons. It was all over that they had slain their enemies. Jesus' vesture is dipped in blood and his name is called the word of God. But to translate this, this means he is clothed in his own victorious blood, not having been wounded on the battlefield. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was taken into battle, his victory cry. Why is it a victory cry? Because the Bible tells us that the blood of Abel spoke out. The blood of Jesus speaks more, much better things than that blood. So when he rides in the battle, his blood is his voice to let him know and his battle cry, you better watch out devil, I'm on my way and I'm going to defeat you. And his name is called the word of God. Listen, and the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, which is the righteousness. And out of his mouth, go up a sharp sword. Listen, a sharp sword. This sword is sharp. This sword is ready to defeat, and it will cut asunder. It will cut to the point that one strike is able to destroy his foes. And out of his mouth go of a sharp sword. That is the word of the Lord that comes out of his mouth. He is the word of the Lord. That with it he should smite the nations. And he shall rule them with an iron, with a rod of iron. And he treads the winepress of the fierceness, of the fierceness, of the fierceness and wrath of God Almighty. If you want to do spiritual warfare, and you mean business with the devil, this is one of the major scriptures that you should use in the Bible. When you, especially when you're dealing with an atmosphere that has been demonically charged and you want to rebuke it out of the atmosphere, this is a major scripture to use when you're in your worship service. Hear me, pastors. When you're in your worship service, in your service, and the atmosphere becomes stagnated, clogged, and you feel the warfare that is in the atmosphere, sometimes we don't stop to recognize what is going on and we continue without success in the word. We have to learn how to stop and address the spiritual energy that is in the atmosphere and rebuke it and say to it, you will not have dominion in this place. You will not rule in here. This is God's house, God's people, I'm God's servant and the atmosphere must come under subjection of the Holy Spirit and the Lord God. God Almighty, in the name of Jesus, we command you by the blood of Jesus, by the warfare that is in Jesus and the warfare that is in us, that we are going to conquer even the persons to which that spirit is in. We bind you in the name of Jesus Christ. You came in here with all that stuff in you, and we are here to deliver your soul today, to free you, to set you free, and set you on course, that now you can be freed in your spirit and your mind and all of that junk that you came in here with it goes back to the very source from whence it came from it goes back to the very pit of hell 
It cannot exist. When we address the atmosphere, those that come into our midst that may not understand, they will get a sense that we are charging the atmosphere with God's presence. And when that atmosphere is charged with God's presence, it frees everything up in it so that the Spirit of God can do exactly what He wishes to do. Our worship services are not ours. They belong to the Lord. When we come into the house of the Lord, we might as well just settle ourselves in. We might as well pray. We might as well worship. We might as well seek the face of the Lord. We might as well hear the word of the Lord. And we must prepare ourselves to entertain the presence of the Lord. Too often we come into the worship service and the energy of the devil is charging the atmosphere and dictating what should occur. The devil is a liar. God is victorious. The blood of Jesus demands something better. The name of Jesus demands something better. That's why the word of the Lord says, if I be lifted up from the earth, I will draw all men unto me. I will make changes that you cannot make if you just lift me up in the atmosphere. Thank you, Jesus. And out of his mouth, the fierceness and the wrath of God Almighty. See, we think that we shouldn't act with a warfare attitude in ministry. I want to tell you right here, right now, the devil is a liar. The God of our salvation has told us to be strong and to be courageous and to do battle against the very enemy that wishes to subdue and to take down. Listen, verse 16, and on his vesture and on his thigh, a name was written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And I saw an angel standing in the sun. And he cried with a loud voice saying to all the fowls that fly in the midst of heaven, come and gather yourselves together upon unto the supper of the great God, that ye may eat the flesh of kings and the flesh of captains, the flesh of mighty men and the flesh of horses and of them that sit upon them and the flesh of all men, both free and bond, both small and great. God wishes for his enemies to be devoured. When you take a fierce attitude by the anointing of God, <clears throat> excuse me, you are making up in your mind that all the things that have charged your atmosphere negatively and demonically will be consumed. We are not going to be passive Christians anymore. It is time to arise into warfare, into spiritual warfare. And I saw the beasts and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against him that sat on the horse and against his army. And the beast was taken and with him the false prophets that wrought miracles before him, which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast. I want to deal with that for just a few moments. Because now there are companies that are, that are telling their employees or asking their employees in lieu of using money, listen, in some of their vending machines, if they get a chip implanted in their hand, they could go to the vending machine, put their seal or put their finger up on that vending machine, that the monies will come out of, the, of, out of an account that they have designated and associated with that chip and they could purchase whatever they want. This is getting us prepared, or those who are willing to do so, prepared to receive the mark of the beast. I remember many years ago, one of the pastors that I served under who was a very astute man in the word of God, he taught that 666 was a computer code, and he linked it into the chip that the government was trying to work on so that they could do exactly what I just mentioned. Put a chip under the skin of a person's body, their hand or wherever, where they can track that person or that person can use that to make purchases. It's just like the iPhone and different platforms that are now causing us to be able to use our devices to actually make purchases, but also it's also desensitizing us to prepare us for the, the subtle taking of the mark of the beast. 
we must learn to be informed about the things that are out there. The Bible says this very clearly. My people perish for the lack of knowledge. God does not want you to perish by any means. But we must be the people of God that understand that God is who he says that he is. We are going to be the people whom God intended. I rebuke every devil. I rebuke the spirit of us seeking vengeance against anything that God himself will not seek vengeance against. You are going to be delivered to walk in love, <clears throat> to walk in freedom, to pray the prayers that God says for you to pray. And when God shifts the prayer in you, you must shift with the prayer that he wishes you to pray. I teach and I've experienced where I prayed one thing for four straight years. And I remember one day sitting down in the pulpit, <clears throat> excuse me, of the church that I was co-pastoring. And the Lord told me right there in that sense when, sentence, when I was about to open up my mouth to pray the prayer that I was going to pray. I prayed like Hannah prayed. I prayed my lips moved, but words did not utter out of my mouth. And the Holy Spirit stopped me and said, don't pray that prayer. Pray this prayer. And when I pray that prayer, I begin to see things happen in the atmosphere. I start seeing things that were hidden from me by the spirit of God. He opened them up and revealed. He gave me, he gave me strategies. He gave me things to do. He showed me things to be prepared for. And he showed me how to navigate through that difficult time. But yet God brought me out as the victor. And he wants to do the same thing for you. Don't take vengeance into your own hand like David. Don't get an attitude saying, I'm going to handle this myself. No, give place to God. Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. That's a powerful statement in and of itself. It does not belong to you. It belongs to me. Let me be God and you be who I created you to be. Let me handle this. God is saying to all of us tonight, I got this. I got your back. You don't have to worry about this because in the appropriate time, in the appropriate season, when my cup has been filled with them, I will act on your behalf. Never take vengeance into your own hands. Give place to God. Let us pray. Father, we thank you in the precious name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, from whom, again, all of your blessings flow. God, we are humbled in your presence tonight, and we're just grateful and thankful unto you for your word. God, as your servant, I pray that I have done glory, given you glory and honor and have done well unto you, God. Because at the end of the day, all glory, all honor, all praise goes to you. Not to flesh, not to man. We can never glory in what you're doing. We're only the conduit by which you choose to send your word and to use us. I'm humbled by your grace and your love and salvation. I thank you for the people. I thank you for the hearers. Now, God, I pray that you seal this word up in all of us. And God, that this word will resonate in our spirits. And that we, God, with every single situation that we're in, that the enemy is defying against us. We know that it's not us, but it's the God in us. And we thank you that you are on our side. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And amen. Also, before we conclude this evening, we want to make sure that those who are listening, those that are centered around us, that don't know the Lord Jesus Christ, we would be remiss as ministers, as pastors, as preachers, as teachers, if we did not lead people to the one 
who empowers us to declare his word. And that is Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone. If you know that you have a need or need of Jesus, you have need of salvation, you have not walked this way before, you know that there's an emptiness in your heart, a void. You can't explain it. You've been trying to fill it with multiple things, drugs, alcohols, friendships, parties, sex, and other things, cars, houses, lands, jobs, promotion, education. But after you achieved all those things and been a part of all those things and participated in sin, you are still empty on the inside. Let me tell you why. Because that void was designed and exists for one purpose and one purpose only. I had a friend that told me who's a doctor, studying to be a doctor, and she shared with me that there are certain things that are designed for X, Y, Z. And that void in you is designed for the Holy Spirit to exist in. There's no ifs, there's no buts, there's no ands. He is the only one that can fill that void and bring true satisfaction. And bring you to a course where you're seeking after God with all your heart, with all your mind, and with all your soul. This is the connection that you're missing. The connection between you and heaven. Between you and God. Let the holy fill the unholy, making you holy for permanent for life. Pray this prayer with me. If you know that you need Jesus Christ and you're sick and tired of being sick and tired. Lord, come into my heart. Come into my spirit. I cry out to you, God, as humbly as I know how. I need you to fill me with your spirit. Take me off of the negative course that I'm on, that is unfruitful, unfulfilling, unsatisfying, and demoralizing. Build me up by your spirit after you fill me so that I can become strong in you and in the power and the might of your strength and become that man or woman that God wishes for me to be. And God, I thank you. I praise you. Forgive me of all sin and all unrighteousness and come and live in my heart, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. If you pray that prayer tonight, you have just become a child of the kingdom. There's more that the Lord would have you to do. It goes beyond just this prayer. You must seek the Lord with all your heart. We pray that the Lord will lead you to a Bible-believing ministry where you can learn the truth, be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, and then be filled with the Holy Spirit and set on a course for life of servitude unto the Lord. We thank you. We bless you. And we honor the Lord for you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. I pray that everyone enjoy the word of the Lord on tonight. That God has shared multiple things with you. And he has begun to do a work in your heart that needs to be done. And that you will no longer seek vengeance of your own self. But you will give place for God to act on your behalf. Again, we thank you and we bless each and every person and we pray that you again have been blessed by the word of the Lord. I now turn it over into the hands of Sister Gloria.